Yeah, hi, thank you so much. We're really happy to be here. I'm joined with um, by Casey Gorell and Carissa Lutstrand, and um, we're, we're all three from the pedestrian unit. And Casey has been at the forefront of a couple of um, signature projects on 8th and 9th Avenue and CB4. But the three of us have been working for over three years on a, a pedestrian plan effort. And that's what we're most excited to talk to you about here today. I did I did share with Christine um, the website where we've been slowly rolling out some of the ideas that I'll share in the PowerPoint. Um, and we are really interested in creating these as tools for, for folks to use and are really interested in forming more relationships with organizations such as yours that are organizing around pedestrian issues and walking and um, really things that are impacting the public realm. So if- Okay, great. Thank you so much for introducing um, yourself to all of us. Maybe since Casey's going to start our presentation, Carissa could introduce herself um, first and then we'll get started. This is Carissa Lidstrand. I'm in the pedestrian unit at DOT and I've been working on a lot of uh, planning and policy for our unit, specifically around the pedestrian mobility plan, which we'll be talking about tonight. And then I'll go. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Casey Grell. I'm also in the pedestrian unit. I'm leading a lot of our design and standards uh, for the unit and for the agency. And I am going to start the presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. OK, so. So thank you so much for having us. Uh, I think we're really excited to present something we've been working on that, um, as Heidi mentioned, we've been working on this for three years. Uh, it re really started just before the pandemic. And then in the early stages of the pandemic, we really um, focused on it because we had a lot of time while at home. So we're going to be presenting the New York City Pedestrian Mobility Plan. Oh, so from a very high level, like we asked the question of like, why does New York City even need a pedestrian mobility plan? And the main reason is that walking is New York's largest mode. So 31% of trips are walking only, and the start and end of every trip involves walking. So whether you're getting on the bus or walking to the subway or even walking to your car, um, all trips involve walking. However, be, even though walking is New York City's largest mode, there's not really a lot of metrics or standards guiding it. So we have metrics looking at Vision Zero and ADA. Um, we even have programs that focus on public space. But when you look at the pedestrian hier hierarchy of need, there's really this, this missing middle um, where there's nothing talking about what pedestrians need to be comfortable and to be convenient. Um, so we're hoping the pedestrian mobility plan will lead to uniformity um, and design standards for pedestrian facilities. Um, to increase walking mode share throughout the city. So now we want to kind of talk about some of the mode share and some of the barriers to walking that kind of frame um, why we need the pedestrian mobility plan. So walking mode share varies greatly throughout the city. Uh, and one thing that's kind of interesting to note is that even in the outer boroughs, it can vary drastically. So in outer Queens, walking is about a quarter of trips. But even in middle Queens, it's a it's, um, little over a third. So like walking changes as you go throughout the boroughs. And what's interesting is that like up till now in regards to pedestrians, there's really only been blanket citywide standards for pedestrian facilities. So one thing we really wanna note is that pedestrian needs vary greatly throughout the city. Um, and we don't really, we don't think blanket statement, blanket standards are appropriate. There's also a lot of physical barriers to walking throughout the city. Um, we're using a lot of data to try to map some of these items, but the top ones are missing sidewalks. So there's whole parts of the city where there are no sidewalks um, at all. There's other areas of the city, such as 8th Avenue, where the sidewalks were insufficient, so people didn't have enough space to walk. Um, another issue is that there might be sufficient sidewalk width, but they're blocked by obstructions that restrict movement. And then a final piece of the pedestrian realm is crossings across the street. So there's a lot of large multi-lane streets that have a lack of crossings to complete the pedestrian network. So some of the solutions we've been using throughout the city, uh, we're building new sidewalks, 
um, throughout the city. We're looking to expand existing sidewalks either through paint or concrete, such as 8th and 9th Avenue. We're also looking to reconstruct sidewalks and remove obstructions. And throughout the city, we're also looking at adding crossings to complete the pedestrian network. We also want to acknowledge that like this is a multimodal aspect, noting that every trip starts and ends with walking. So looking at 7th Avenue where we widen the sidewalk but added bus bulbs. So someone who gets off the bus immediately becomes a pedestrian and needs a place to walk. We also pair a lot of our improvements with bike improvements. So adding pedestrian space to shorten crossings or pairing it with a new bike lane such as the lower left where we actually are expanding a sidewalk around a cemetery. Um, and temporary materials, and we'll be, we'll be building it out in a capital plan um, that was paired with a bike lane installation. Um, 20th Street in Brooklyn is where we added a shared use path for bikes and pedestrians as more of a recreational path along um, Greenwood Cemetery. So acknowledging that we're part of a bigger plan within the city, um, but really want to highlight pedestrians. We also know that there's differences of what walking needs are throughout the city. So as the commute patterns change throughout the city, we also know there's gonna be different situations and solutions um, depending on where you are. So this is kind of like a graphical representation of some of our thinking where in the central core, we need to really look at reducing congestion and creating more pedestrian space in these very high pedestrian volume areas. And then as you move out through the city, we might be looking at doing more um, filling gaps in the network or reducing pinch points, um, which is really to increase mode share by creating more connections and increasing comfort. And then the yellow range throughout a large swath of the city, it's really spot improvements to better accommodate the vulnerable, um, what we call lone pedestrians, um, by making sure we have sufficient crossings, adding new sidewalks and improving existing connections. And then kind of at a bare minimum throughout the entire city, but mostly on the periphery, just really ensuring that we have baseline pedestrian accommodations and ADA accessibility. And the reason for all of this is that pedestrians have really been left out of a lot of thinking and planning throughout the city. So there's no you know, true pedestrian modeling. There's not really any stringent design requirements. Um, so far, the city hasn't had a pedestrian plan, even though we're a walking city. Um, and an issue is that pedestrians don't really function like other modes. Um, so we're not pedestrians aren't as much point A to B um, and can be very difficult to analyze at a network scale. And that's one of the reasons there has been a lack of pedestrian planning. Um, another issue is that sidewalks don't really have stringent design guidelines or even like level of service analysis or modeling standpoints. So it's very difficult to pin down like how big of a sidewalk do you really need in these locations? Um, currently, they're really the only thing we have to point to is ADA, which in most cases is um, insufficient for the amount of pedestrians we have. So we really want to see a street categorization based pedestrian demand model that can really target design guidelines for our sidewalks. All right, now I'm going to go into that. Mm -hmm. um, so next slide. So the first question that we kind of asked ourselves is, um, what kind of uses are there for the sidewalk? And being part of the Department of Transportation, we think about the sidewalk um, as being a space for movement. And But we know it's much more than that. It's also a place that you meet up with friends, that you use for leisurely strolls, whether it be for exercise or for shopping. Um, there's many different roles that the sidewalk takes, but we really wanted to focus on the sidewalk as a space for movement. And so when developing the pedestrian demand map, we wanted to think of the sidewalk in that way. Um, so we started to think about how many categories we might need um, to categorize each street in the city. And so we came up with five different categories ranging from baseline at the lowest level to global at the highest level. And thinking about each of these streets um, as their functional use. So baseline being kind of the more uh, lower density residential areas where you might find that lone pedestrian that Casey was talking about. And then a community connector is where you might find more people on the sidewalk. You might need some room for passing, but these are really the corridors that are connecting you from 
um, the residential areas to the more neighborhood corridor where you might be doing your grocery shopping or going to um, get on the bus. And so that's the neighborhood corridor is where you might find small groups of people. Um, and that's where the density kind of starts to bump up a little more and things become a little more commercial. Um, you might find a minor park um, and then regional corridor takes up to the next level. And that's where you might find um, subway stations as well as larger groups of people um, that might need to pass one another. And then global is the highest level which has crowds of people. This is really where people from not just the region are coming, but even throughout the United States or further, um, and is mostly concentrated in more of like the Midtown Manhattan core. Next slide, okay. And then, so this is a look at the demand map um, at, from a citywide level. And on the left is a breakdown of all the kind of data crunching that we did to determine what goes into each of these categories. And so there's a lot of different elements here. So we looked at um, commercial things like retail, restaurants. Uh, we looked at office square footage as well as residential square footage to kind of delineate between the different corridor categories. We also looked at things like um, school enrollment and school frontages. Um, we also looked at subway ridership to discern between um, like regional corridors, global corridors and neighborhood corridors. Um, but really this is all to say, there's a lot that goes into this and we can always come back to this slide um, whenever we take questions, but um, there's a lot of different factors um, that went into determining the corridor categories. And kind of stepping back and looking at how many, like say regional corridors there are throughout the city in comparison to the other categories. Um, you can see the pie chart on the top right shows that about like 85% of the city is the baseline and community connector um, corridors that we we're talking about that are primarily residential, um, corridors, and then there's about 15% that are the more um, heavy demand for pedestrian generators, um, and about half a percent is those global corridors that were mentioned. So that kind of gives you a breakdown of what we're looking at. And then the really great thing about this demand map and categorizing all the streets is that we can then start talking about what type of design guidelines would we want to see for each of these corridor categories, knowing that each street is so different from one another. So we first took a look at um, kind of the anatomy of a sidewalk. And so you might recognize the term clear path, which references um, ADA guidelines, which is the unobstructed path along a sidewalk. And so we kind of took that as our base point. We're really wanting to expand upon that and go above and beyond because ADA for New York City is such a low number, especially in these high pet demand areas. And so that's where we came up with the term walk lane, which um, encompasses the clear path is encompassed within the walk lane, but then there's also extra space for pedestrian movement that might happen between different elements on the sidewalk. And so that's in kind of the pinkish tone um, that's in the illustration. And then we also have the furnishing zone, which is recognizing that there are a lot of different elements that are placed on the sidewalk, whether it's a street tree or a bench, um, and the walk lane may feed into that, um, but doesn't fully encompass that zone. And so we took a look at what kind of guidelines we uh, might wanna see for all of these different corridor categories. And so you can see the chart 
on the bottom right. So on the left side of that chart is the corridor category, starting at baseline, going up to global. And then we have the um, at our aspirational sidewalk width, which ranges between eight to 25 feet, depending on the category. And then we have um, different guidelines, whether it's a walk lane, clear path, or furnishing zone. Um, and so each of these, um, again, looking at the corridor categories, have to do with a pedestrian demand um, for that street. And so global corridors, we would love to see sidewalk widths that are 25 feet wide or more. Um, and then, you know, we would prefer to have a 20 foot walk lane for that, a 15 foot clear path and then a five foot furnishing zone. And so we can come back to this. I know this is a lot of numbers to put out there, um, but kind of setting up for another guideline that we wanna discuss is kind of the amenities. Um, we also wanna look at the spacing of those amenities um, because we recognize that they come in all different shapes and sizes and different uses um, between a mailbox to a street tree. There, there's a lot of different dimensions there. And we want to incentivize street trees on all of our sidewalks. And you might have noticed in the chart that the furnishing zone varied in number um, between two feet to five feet and recognizing that street trees are five feet typically wide, um, we know that that might encroach on the walk lane. So we wanted to come up with a set of design guidelines to account for that. So um, taking a look at the graphic on the bottom, starting with the left hand side where it says furniture zone, you can see a little mailbox and a bench there. So those fit within the furniture zone. And so those can be spaced um, as close to each other as their individual design guidelines um, allow them to be. Um, but moving over towards where the street trees are in the middle part of the image, because those encroach on the walk lane, we want there to be enough space for pedestrians to be able to pass each other. And so having that space to kind of like pull over, um, whether you're able-bodied or in a wheelchair, we want to be able to have enough space. So our amenity spacing guideline for that would be um, 15 feet between amenities, and then the amenity shouldn't be more than 10 feet wide um, so that we don't get kind of these long walls happening um, if the amenity is encroaching on the walk lane. Um, and then the clear path, should be maintained throughout the entire block of the sidewalk, um, unobstructed, but it can kind of curve slightly as you can see on the right-hand side of the image, as long as the width is still kept. So I know that was a lot of information and we've been kind of rolling with it and you know wanting to talk to other agencies about these design guidelines because we're so excited about finally having something that we can um, fight for more pedestrian space with. And so we have a few next steps that we just want to share with you um, on the next slide. Um, one of the things we've been working on a lot is with the MTA um, about using our design guidelines in their work. Um, especially around like elevator projects on sidewalks. Um, we've been having discussions with DSNY about um, some of their garbage collection in street pilots and then um, open restaurants. We've also been in conversations about like the sidewalk width designations and kind of using our guidelines um, as a starting point to really talk about how different each corridor category is. Um, and then we have a lot of things that we're wanting to do um, as well, like talk about standardizing um, revocable consents. Um, right now, that's kind of a, a blanket clear path right now. Um, and so we're wanting to tie that to the pedestrian mobility plan. Um, we're also working on updates to the street design manual. 
and then um, just working with other agencies um, when we can to either make policy reforms that align better with these guidelines or just have more conversations about how we can each adjust um, what we're working on to accommodate each other's work. So I know that was a lot of information and I'm sure there are a lot of questions and um, especially about all of the numbers that we just showed. Thank you so much. I mean, what is ex exciting is, as you said, at least to me, as who is a planner, uh, is to see that finally there is, you know, a, a, a coherent approach to the sidewalk rather than being an afterthought. And it's it's really really so important for um, the comfort of the pedestrian. So, who has a question? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, Alan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, quite a project. I think for um, a long time, I guess the city just felt that pedestrians could take care of themselves somehow. You know, oh, don't, don't manage to get from one side of the street to the other without mm -hmm. doing much damage to themselves or to someone else. So they said they'll take care of themselves. So this is really a step up uh, in terms of uh, providing um, comfort, as you put it. Um, I, I was just um, looking at the rankings and I was surprised to see how much it was weighted towards the baseline and the next one. But I guess if you take into account this outside the outer boroughs, um, that really weights everything towards um, thinking about more of perhaps how we, how, how you handle the upper portion as, right? Because the pedestrians aren't impacted as much in those other ones. And uh, so did you think about possibly um, finessing this somehow and having like a two-part report, you know, more the, con how the congest, how the upper portions are, are laid out, right? Laid out as opposed to the, the, the bottom two somehow is that something that is um, you think would, might be necessary some way? I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Yeah. You absolutely are, Alan. We actually, we think about it, that it works in the map to have the five categories and it's sort of, I've been digesting the DSNY trap um, future of trash. And it's interesting to note that they're like 77% of streets can handle a single bin containerization, which I'm like, huh, that lines up <laughs> with what we see a little bit in the street design, I'm sorry, in our work, which is, you know, 60% or baseline streets that we see lone um, pedestrians. So I think we just sometimes think of New York as more midtown or downtown Manhattan. And there are like a huge area of the city right. that ADA baseline is totally fine. But where we really see the distinction is what sort of project types and initiatives that we want to propose for the different categories. And we are starting to really see two to um, twin streams coming out of that more in the work that we would wanna do in those areas and maybe some of the policy um, things we would wanna pursue in those areas, but feel pretty good about the map of, of the five categories and just acknowledging that a global corridor is a very rare thing. Um, and that's why you have those really necessary generous WIS and other sort of design guidelines that we would never need um, in a neighborhood maybe like you know, park slope or something like that. Right. Okay, thanks again, very Betty. Yes, sorry, I, I, this is really fascinating to me and I'm glad about this project. Now I'm gonna undermine that by saying, I have never been so excluded in my life as I was invisible in this presentation. Both me as a mobility scooter user, you really need to get some people who rely on wheeled transportation, wheelchairs and scooters, because we are so excluded and purposely excluded in this that it would be good to do something about that. Uh, two, being downtown, our street design is so different and everything that gets called for is so different that a lot of the things said are, don't really apply to down here. I mean, keep in mind, we're one of the places where 
as I said, sanitation was going to do something with containerization. Some of the streets like Cedar Street, the whole street isn't even big enough to put the containers required for the buildings on that street. I mean, we're just a whole nother scale of it's incredibly small. I mean, we have streets that are, the sidewalk is only, it's not even three foot wide. And there's a pole in the middle of it. And I'm on, a, I'm on my scooter trying to get down. And I mean, clearly you can't. On the other hand, I can't jump off the curb. But so when you have sidewalk extensions, do you really account for the fact that if somebody is on a wheel device, they can't use that excess space. They're kind of restricted. Either they're in the street or they're with the painted on sidewalk or they're on the elevated sidewalk, but they can't move between the two of them because okay. that's not how streets designed. You're absolutely right. And like the, the painted sidewalks are in no way the last step. And Casey is working on capital plans for every piece of paint that we have um, in the city. And it's sort of like a push pull between are we aggressively claiming the space and paint? Well, or do we not do that improvement until there is the capital plan? Um, and neither option really feels that great. Um, regarding Lower Manhattan, the map sort of shows with global corridors that some of these streets, if you need the whole right away for pedestrians, we really think that that's pointing to different sort of project right. types. Um, and there is an effort, the agency's hired Sam Schwartz, they're working on a whole plan for downtown Manhattan and um, our office is in downtown Manhattan and we would love to have you at, at 55 Water if you want to talk about um, things further or take a walk around the neighborhood. Um, Christine has my contact information. You're more than welcome to reach out. Great, I'll have Christine send it because again, I, I'm down here. I'm chair of the transportation committee down here, right. which is why Ed Pinkard gets lots of calls from me. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, keep in mind to other comments, because these are kind of randomly placed. I just took notes as I heard them. Uh, the demand map, again, would be a real challenge in the district, because as you can see, the streets kind of are all of them at once. Uh, and I'm in Battery Park City, although I get most of my complaints from FIDI and the historic districts in Tribeca, because they have incredibly small streets. Uh, some of the spaces that have demand groups, again, are mixed. The walking lane that I looked at uh, is really not for mobility users like myself. So walk, I don't take offense at the word walk, but it's really kind of a mobility lane for pedestrians. I, I don't know how to get around that. But to me, it's more like a space. Why? Because it's a place you can detour off of the through path, but it's not a walking path that I could follow because there are too many barriers to me and to someone like me. So it's, it's a little bit misleading when you have a lane and it's not contiguous in any way. Anyhow. Another thing that I wanted to bring up too was, I'm surprised you didn't bring up the, a pedestrian plan that looked at the construction diversions, because that's one of the biggest concerns that we get. And I can tell you as a mobility user, it's absolutely terrible because they just, the construction people do whatever they do and the pedestrians are at their own risk to figure out how to get around it. We have, um, we have shared this initiative and effort with OM. OMC, the people that do permits for, for our office, trying to get them to work some of these guidelines into the, what they issue, uh, we should follow up with them on that effort. Yeah, and the other issue is that, because it's so common down here, is with resiliency plans is changing a lot of things, such as the distance between any resiliency structure and a tree has to be at least 15 feet, or there needs to be some kind of uh, exemption made. So there are those factors that could make a challenge for some of the things that you want to do with your design features. Absolutely. And I mean, you're really putting your finger on it. I mean, this is really aspirational. And like, <laughs> sometimes we feel like, you know, we're trying our best against a lot of different factors and the competing um, issues on the sidewalk. And some are easier <laughs> than others. Some of those like um, resiliency are similar to the security hardenings that we have seen that we've had right. very little ability um, to influence. So, you know, we've tried to be satisfied with putting out good information, creating good maps, um, documenting the problem, having aspirational guidelines, trying to build support and knowledge for this initiative within our own agency, interagency. And then now, lastly, with advocates and the public, there is a website um, that has some of this information on it. Um, and just to build momentum, 
and support and knowledge around these ideas, we certainly don't think that they're gonna unlock all of the problems that we all know exist in the pedestrian realm. Okay, thank you so much. I have I have one or two comments of myself is, um, yeah, as far as the open restaurant and open dining, the, the distance between, um, the distance between side one sidewalk cafe to the next is also very important, right? So because you have an encroachment there, and then and then that measurement of eight feet is not is not realistic. And so hopefully, you will convince the unit to change those numbers depending of where they are. Um, and. One thing I didn't see there is the subway grids. We have a lot of them in our neighborhood. 8th Avenue, 6th Avenue, 7th Avenue. And I tell you, people don't want to walk on that. And so it would be interesting to give them a role and a measurement of their own as, as an, an obstruction. And maybe it's not a full obstruction, but it is clearly an obstruction. I mean, you know, you see people grouped all on the left and the right, but they don't want to be on the side on the on the grid. Yeah, you you are correct, and we were making that um, point when we were discussing this internally. I feel like we've had some, and Casey and Carissa are really the geniuses behind the maps, but we have you know been really good at getting some of these things mapped but there are limitations to what we could map and while we consider that to be what we call an obstruction um i don't know if we have a good way of mapping it the same way we have some right. of the other other things so we're kind of like straddling the middle with with that one and i think that's kind of like one of the things that's maybe in the next um mm -hmm. round of things hopefully and the, the final comment is on sanitation. Yes, I read their report, obviously. And, um, and you know, thinking that what, 61% of the city is going to still have their garbage on the sidewalk just absolutely blows my mind. It's, I know there is not a lot of traffic, but still, this is, this is still a very concerning, um, uh, you know, approach to uh, garbage. Right, yeah, the focus was on containerization, right. not on, right. on full movement. And I think more reflection of in some parts of the city that it would be in the parking lane. Um, but yeah, yeah, I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten th through the whole report. It's quite long, right. um, but um, it's very interesting, a lot of the things that are in there. And I haven't gotten to next steps, so it's hard for me to right. say anything too intelligent at this point, but um I was just noting that a lot of the mapping things seemed seemed similar, and because we really did all the mapping really in house, and that was something that we thought we would outsource to a consultant. I was pretty happy to see our efforts very similar to a consultant that you know is highly mm -hmm. thought of. So that made me feel like happy about that. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that rolls out. And my understanding is that NYCHA has a separate. Um, pilot that they're also working on for yes. their trash. So anyone, anyone else? We're, we're good. Um, well, that was a very, very interesting. Right. Well, and I mean, I ideally, I think to Betty's point, we need, you know, a capital reconstruction and a splitting of the space on both sides. And, you know, Casey has um, develop some concepts for that that are pretty exciting that would be good to maybe talk about at some point and build support for and um, the things that people brought up about Ninth Avenue and that sidewalk space not really being feeling like a safe space to be in is, is something that um, is on our radar radar and we've talked a bit about with the bike unit <clears throat> and we'd like to work on some you know piloting using some ped stamps in some of these painted spaces similar to what bikes gets and also maybe um, more communication and PSAs around you know how these spaces should be used and respected by um, yeah 
cycle yeah, is so that we don't feel satisfied well we're happy with this space being claimed we don't feel satisfied with all of it so just want to to state that as well and i think there is another part to that which is the uh, um uh, the fact that the rest that the space stops so there is no continuation south if people were getting on the space at 42nd street and walking up there would be more uh, use and more traffic because now it just kind of stops there and it's not, people are on the, the sidewalk and they're not going to go in the middle. So I think, I think this is something also to uh, think about. It's like continuing, uh, uh, continuing the process and continuing it down so that people get more comfortable. Uh, David has a, a point. Um, just a quick question. Is there, is there any, um... Uh, prognosis about about uh, converting some of these sidewalk extensions and to, to, to bring them up to the level of the of the sidewalk as far as the capital capital expenditures yeah i mean we we were thinking about pitching some of um these as um for some of the federal grants that were coming out because we really see them as like this great intersectionality of the public realm both as like economic development pedestrian safety mobility areas around um transit and um so that was something that we were um, proposing to our grants team that we could think about and we do develop new needs all the time and um, have no shortage of like great ideas for how we can develop these blocks. It, they are enormously expensive and Casey can speak more to it than I can, but I think it's like 10 million a block or something. So, you know, part of what we're trying to do with our work is just a reflection that it's so much harder to improve the pedestrian realm fully because you have to do a great change and you have to have utilities moved. It's not as simple as red or green paint. And, you know, that's why we want to talk to you all today because it's like we feel like we need to talk more about what we need for the pedestrian realm. And then other people can start talking about that. And maybe that turns into, um, a desire for capital investment in some of these areas. Did I understand you correct to, to raise one block up to the sidewalk level would cost $10 million? Well, I can caveat that a little bit. So that's kind of one of the issues um, is, is the amount of work that goes into it. So, and it's one thing that our unit is actually working on is trying to pilot, you know, what New York City, some of the agencies would consider revolutionary design or like um, construction techniques, which happen throughout the world. Um, currently with our current standards to move the grading, change the drainage infrastructure. Also typically when we're doing this amount of work, we upgrade all the other utilities. It does come around to that, that price tag um, from like a full reconstruction. I think something we are wanting to push is that to build these spaces, we need to be more innovative and more cost-effective because we will never get there at our current rate. And we need to come up with new design standards and overcome some of our other agencies' feelings about um, their standards to push, to be able to build these much quicker um, and much more efficiently. Hmm. And we're hoping that the PED plan can actually push some of those conversations um, forward. I mean, it seems like drainage would be the, you know, raising grates can't be that expensive. Drainage, I can see might be, but, it, you know, it might be that you just retain the existing drainage and have troughs across the new raised area that go, that go, that reach the existing grates that you don't actually, then you don't have to move them. You, you, you bring the water to them and have a great cover. You know, I mean, anyway, I mean, I guess that's what do you you're want to do. You want to work with us, David, because that <laughs> is one of our big ideas. What we're okay, trying to yeah. do. I mean, yeah. you need, you, clearly you need solutions that don't require moving big stuff. Right. Yeah. And that is like one of the ideas that we're most excited about. But it can be hard to get other people to be like, oh, that's OK construction. And we work a lot with our capital team, but then they work with a whole separate agency, which is DDC, which is, you know, a different a different entity with different priorities and their standards are more important to them than maybe what we're thinking about from our side. So, but yes, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> um, 
Um, I don't know if it's a great idea, but, but how about those platforms that you use at the bus stops? Is that a possibility at all? Yeah, I mean, it's something we definitely have in our toolkit. The, they, they have their own kind of pros and cons to, to using them. Um, mm -hmm. They actually require a pretty substantial curb reveal to maintain um, accessibility or to not propose it be a trip hazard. Um, we we looked into doing them on Lexington when we did the sidewalk expansion at Grand Central, and and they weren't they unfortunately weren't feasible um, for those. But I think you know this next step is is there like an interim interim treatment like if we can yeah. go from paint to something to mm -hmm. then like a full capital like what does that look like and yeah. what other treatments can we use yeah. to really bolster these? Yeah, this way maybe you get folks more used to using the, the sidewalk and you get the bikers and everybody else used to not using that section. So and, and I actually do think like on Ninth thing. Avenue, like once it gets warm out, I do think pedestrians are going to really claim it. I think mm -hmm. 8th Avenue went through a lot of kind of yeah. back and forth on people using it, but it now feels very, I think, relatively well well respected. I think I think Ninth Avenue is having a bit of a growing pain, but I, I, I don't think it's going to be perfect, but I, I do hope once it comes to summer and it's full of pedestrians, mm -hmm. the bikes will stay out of it. More. Well, I think 8th Avenue and 9th Avenue, even though they're a block away, they're very different, you know, pathways. I think 9th is I always had the bikes going up and down delivery and 8th Avenue is more. more yeah, the volume commuters, that sort of thing. You know, they, they were the out volume of, the of the the volume of restaurant and deliveries on 9th yes. is huge, huge. This is, you know, side to side to side to side all the way up where on ninth have on eighth avenue there are very little delivery uh, mm. delivery jobs you know they're not, not as complicated as they say right with delivery so everything is like very local yes mm. uh betty yes no, thank you my demands are actually smaller than some of the things people are asking for i the problem of getting from the, from the regular sidewalk to the painted one is the challenge, but to me, you don't have to lift it so it's all even. I'd be very happy, and I hate to use the pedestrian ramps because people think of the current size and width that they are on the corners. I don't think they should be limited there or anywhere else. A little wider would be better because I use them all the time. I see that people wait for one person goes in each direction and they nobody wants to cross someone else and it's not an efficient use of those spaces. They were a little wider, at least, you know, people coming and going in both directions or a group of two could travel together, be better. But anyway, using those in more frequency along the length would allow the movement up and down to the different levels. To me, that would be adequate and you wouldn't have to make a whole lot of other changes. And we have some of them down here. And what I've looked at is where they go, this, the curb is actually beveled down the full length with bollards along it so the cars don't come up into the, where the pedestrians are. You have to stop people down here. But nevertheless, that allows pedestrians and people to move in and out of the street area to the sidewalk area very easily along the whole length. They just move between the bollards on the, the area that's slanted. No, I think the 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 ramp is a is a good idea, especially for mid blocks. And if you had them somewhat consistently spaced, it would really open up the space. And I do think, to your point about the size, we are in a lot of these congested areas trying to propose wider ramps, especially if we widen the sidewalk. Like if you have a twenty five foot wide sidewalk, you could have a ten foot wide ramp that allows two way traffic. And you know, so many people have carts and like are pushing strollers. Like everyone needs to use a ped ramp now. Um, so we need to make them wider. If, if I may say, there is an interesting uh, thing going on when you look at the pedestrian crossing and, and the, the, the island for the refuge is encroaching on it. And so much smaller, right? And then your pedestrian, your ramp is not as wide as the pedestrian crossing. So the standard should be the pedestrian crossing. If you, are, if you have expanded that pedestrian crossing because you needed that capacity, that means you need the same to go from the sidewalk to the street. So and that's that, like an interesting point of like how much ADA like guides or like limits the city of like, oh, it's ADA, check the box. Like, I think right. that's where like pushing the boundaries of like, no, we need more. Like right. New York has so many people. We need to yeah. like 
do double ped ramps because we just need more than the minimum. Like the minimum is like for the entire country. Like it's not, it's right. not appropriate right. here. Thank uh, you. I've been fighting that very point. And in fact, it is a minimum. And that's why I just, I keep telling people like Ed Pingar that it's a minimum, it's not a requirement. So sorry, Christine. No, no, go ahead, David uh, Warren. Yeah, just um, quickly, um, and you might have to talk to me offline about this, but um, by the Bronx Zoo, where the bus is, there's like these rubber things that goes for several blocks. And I'm trying to get that for the, our Penn South area because it's a naturally recurring older community. Uh, it would naturally slow down the cyclists on both 8th and 9th Avenue. How would, and, and it's a dot thing, I think, or maybe MTA that did that in the Bronx by the zoo. I don't know if you all are familiar with it. Um, how would I get involved with you at DOT to get that for our community here? Yeah, so that was that was installed by the bike unit as part of the protected bike lane to do the to make the bus stops accessible. Um, so the bus didn't pull into the bike lane. And and we did those. That's what um uh, was it Alan you know, or David was other David was saying about using the rubber products. That we did on Seventh. So on Seventh Avenue, we used the rubber bus borders, um, and we yeah, fantastic. Using them. Yeah, so we do explore using those. We have a limited supply that we can use every year, um, and we have to spread stuff throughout the entire city. But it is a product we use. Um, How could I talk to you about doing that in a specific location? Is there a number or an email I could contact somebody about that? Well, David, give me the locations, and I'll uh, send them to Heidi. Okay. That would give be me great. the location and we'll do that. Okay, thank okay. you so much. I love your presentation. Thank you all. Michael. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, everybody. I really appreciate the work that you put into the presentation. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little shocking that it took three years to um, come up with um, the design, but I do appreciate it. Um, I, full disclosure, I am a cyclist, I'm a pedestrian, I ride a car occasionally. Um, and like I said before, if we don't design our built environment to um, make the lives of people with abilities easier, it impacts us all. So I don't care if you have a luggage and you're going on vacation or if you have kids in a stroller, the better that we design our streets to, um, to accommodate uh, accessibility, um, the better everybody will be. Um, in terms of the um, the design that you laid out, I think that it, you know, of course it's it, it's you know uh, anorexic, and I think that it could be doubled. Um, uh, as a as a tree steward, I know that the trees can be really uh, an intrusion on a pedestrian space. I can only imagine somebody that uh, uses. Uh, assistive devices to navigate some of these tight sidewalks. Um, I wonder how, if y'all have thought about moving the street trees to the, let's say we're moving one, one out of every three, every third car and putting a street tree in that place surrounded by, uh, let's say, uh, first of all, the street pit, the tree pits should be 10 to 15 uh, feet wide. I don't know why we're still planting trees that are like three feet by three feet, but, um, and then surrounding that with street tree guards that are super durable, maybe bullards, um, and that could be maybe working in conjunction with the department, the parks department too, um, to help facilitate some of the attitudes and uh, support that we hope to generate with this plan. Um, just, uh, just putting the street trees on the street side of the uh, design. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is something that we have discussed with parks um, and, and seeing some other cities do some best practices that we've learned from other cities. And um, we only had one meeting with parks. I think parks is really focused on their mandate of adding more trees and sort of the paradigm that they find themselves in. Um, but that's why I think this has been a very long effort because sometimes you have to come at people a couple of different times with the same sort of thought or conversation. So, um, and Parks is a very diverse, big agency of people kind of moving around. So 
we have put that out there and we do have that as goals and we are looking for corridors. We're trying to work with like where their brains are. So like, where is there like a heat island impact that they want to mitigate? Well, actually CB4 is like one of their priority areas. And we stopped them from putting, Christine knows, I, I asked them, please, please do not put one tree on 43rd street between 9th and 10th because the sidewalk's already too narrow. Like, can we work together on some of these things? So I hope that we can. Um, and it's certainly like a goal. And, and like you said, um, putting it out in the parking lane in some of the neighborhoods like yours would be a really fun design to try. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Heidi and team, Casey and Carissa. This is just amazing. It, gives me hope, you know, it gives me hope that people are working on the things that we think are important. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's really very um, hopeful, plus the, the fantastic job you do when you uh, do it on the ground. Thank you so much for everything and, um, and for coming tonight. Really appreciate that. Thank you. We enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, all.